This is uh, Guardsman George Arthur Dunn, number 2740462, 3rd Battalion of the Welsh Guards. I was in the house at the time and I went out the back door and I felt a swoosh across and, and then we heard a terrific explosion. Next morning my pal and I got on our bicycles. We'd heard there was one of the Germans had crashed. And uh, sure enough, there was a, the police hadn't even arrived then, there was nothing. We just had a quick look around. The smell was horrible. And there were parts of uh, uh, airplanes and bodies and uniforms lying around all over the place. It was terrible. I never forgot it. We did fire watching. They had to have someone in the building at night in case there were fire. And uh, we did this with the uh, help of the young ladies. There were 30 young ladies in the office and about half a dozen mature ladies. So they used to split us up, one mature lady, three or four young ones, and myself or my colleague. We were the only males. I don't know what we'd have done if there'd been a fire. <laughs> RSM Britain was the famous RSM at the time. He was quite well known. Uh, he had us on the parade grounds for about six weeks and in the barrack rooms, polishing all our gear, getting us up to standard for public duties. And uh, something happened there. It was reported in the press that uh, there'd been a severe, very severe complaint about the language used by the sergeant major on the parade ground. <laughs> he was trying to knock us into shape. <laughs> he did one or two naughty words and uh, <laughs> He got a bit of a reprimand for that. And uh, anyway, we did make the grade and we did some public duties. I do remember a young lady getting behind me in the sentry box and tickling my posterior and having a, good, having a photograph taken. And it was a good laugh, but I tried not to laugh. <laughs> While I was on sentry duty one day, uh, I was told by the sergeant that there was a, uh, an Englishman, a little Cockney, was coming. They'd been, the Russians had found him in, in the eastern zone. He'd apparently stayed behind. He'd found himself a girlfriend and he'd hidden and stayed when everybody else got out. He stayed behind and the Russians got him and they were kicking him out and they were bringing him to the the guard room and uh, it was amazing they came in this great big car and a russian in his full uniform i don't know what rank he was he looked like a, a brigadier general or something like that uh, <laughs> and uh, there's this scruffy little man cockney boy he, he was handing him over it was sad to a degree uh, they were well-disciplined people and they were doing their best. They were, they were very poor and, and underfed. They lived on a pretty uh, tight diet. There, was no, there were no problems with the Germans at all. Uh, the Poles used to go for the Germans. I remember one night I was on sentry duty and this old lady was pushing a four-wheeled truck with some uh, what they call it, firewood. She'd been collecting this stuff. And then two young Poles came out and snatched the, the wee trolley and away they went. And uh, we, I called out the guard, but it didn't, they were all they were away by then. Yeah, that was quite sad. It was a lovely moonlit night. I was one end of the compartment and uh, with my rifle and my pal was at the other end of the compartment and the boys were all in between. 
and uh, uh, I heard this shout and uh, a dash down that came from the far end of the compartment and uh, there was my uh, pal with the window open and the train and he said, he said I've stolen my so-and-so rifle <laughs> and uh, it obviously hung from the, the roof of the train down and pushed the window open and snatched his rifle which was lying in the corner. So uh, that was, uh, there was well, the train was halted and uh, uh, apparently there were quite a number of uh, Arabs on the, the roof and they all disappeared into the sand dunes. You could see them going and running away with the moonlight. I was on from six o'clock till eight in the morning, it was quite dark. And I was standing there uh, outside the guardroom in the sentry. And uh, this vehicle was coming down the road, a big old van. And as it came by, this cylindrical package landed at my feet. And <laughs> I, was, I didn't know what to do. <laughs> you can imagine that. Uh, so I eventually I shouted to the sergeant of the guard, and he came running out. Oh, he says, Done, he said, the, oh, the, the paper, I see the papers have arrived, the newspapers. And I'd been standing there waiting for this thing to blow up. It never did. So we'd picked up these sailors in Malta, all young boys, and they'd all grown beards to make themselves look a bit older, because they were probably only about 18 or 19. And uh, we had this rough weather in the Bay of Biscay and uh, all these na young Navy boys <laughs> vomiting their hearts up. And you'd see them come in and they'd have carrots in their beard, these beards that they'd grown. It was, we, we used to cheer uh, and take the mickey out of them. But we got home safe. They mobbed at uh, York, from Liverpool to York. I'd uh, bought a bottle of whiskey in Port Said. We were stuck on York Station in the middle of the night and we didn't know what to do and I said come on with my pal we'll have, open that bottle of whiskey and ask the porter, there was one porter on the station and uh, he said oh he brought two, three tumblers and so we got the whiskey open, poured it in and we went to drink and it was cold tea. We, I'd smuggled this in, the, in an army blanket at the bottom of my kit bag all the way home, and that's what it turned out. It was cold tea. Looked at the, the, the porter said, "Look at the bottom of the bottle," and they'd blown a hole in the bottom of the bottle, taken the whiskey out, and filled it full of cold tea. So there we are. We drank some of somebody's health on York Station. <laughs>